Okay, thank you very much for joining everybody. Uh, today I'm joined by a, a good friend, Kenny Watkins, who's the publisher of a very, very important part of the cannabis industry. Uh, he's the publisher of AGEM, American Journal of Endocannabinoid Medicine. Kenny joins me from uh, Philadelphia, South Jersey area, and we're thrilled to be, and I got that wrong? <laughs> North Jersey area, about... Uh, North Jersey, okay. North. You know us Southerners. Uh, so we're thrilled to have Kenny with us. Uh, AGEM, uh, I, I came across uh, AGEM and I met Kenny about a little over a year ago when AGEM sponsored one of the very first uh, super high-end uh, educational CME conferences for uh, medical professionals, physicians in New York City at Columbia University. And it was really a turning point for the industry. I, I, when we entered cannabis from pharma, uh, uh, we, we wanted to be at the intersection of anything educational. Uh, because that's the world we live in in pharma. When Kenny and I met, it was like it was a kindred spirits because we feel uh, like we are the bridge between pharma and cannabis. And we're starting to see a lot of that now. Uh, the industry has changed dramatically over the last year in COVID. And, uh, you know, Kenny, if you could just give us a, a brief overview of what brought you to the, to the journal and, and how yeah. you ended up publishing AGEM and, uh, uh, and, and, and how the industry has changed over the last year since that first uh, conference at Columbia back in November of 19. Yeah, it's amazing how, how, how much things have changed and how, how quickly things have changed. Um, I come to the, um, to the cannabis industry from the medical publishing industry on the pharmaceutical side. So I've worked for um, the American College of Physicians, um, the British Medical Association, and, and many other for-profit companies um, for over 20 years. And in, I would say about five years ago, I started to see how the, the major medical journals were, were handling and, and addressing cannabis. And, you know, what, one thing that was very consistent was even the articles that were somewhat favorable toward medical cannabis, they always ended with, um, there is no research. And there's, you know, I have to tell you, there's tons of research out there. Or, um, you know, these studies, uh, these studies are, are, are small patient pools. They're ends of one, ends of 10. Right. And, and, and we can't draw anything conclusive from them, which is, which is ludicrous, because of course we can. Um, and, and one thing that I noticed was cannabis was helping people, and the people that it was helping didn't need to see a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. All they knew is that, you know, I rub this ointment on my knee and I get some pain relief. You know, um, I, I felt, wow, you know, what this industry really needs um, to, to help legitimize it would be a medical journal that focused like a laser on the science and the research behind cannabis. And that's it, is the science, it is the science and the medicine. That's kind of what drew us to it as well, uh, coming from pharma. And, uh, and early on, I started attending all the conferences in Israel and internationally. It's interesting how far ahead of the world, uh, the rest of the world is in the United States. I mean, there's, there's, there's very little science coming out of the United States in cannabis, and most of it's international. Right. Um, but everybody still looks to the United States for leadership. Uh, in the space because we're still one of the leading medical societies in the world. Um, so it, it's kind of backwards from that perspective. Um, what do you think of the, what do you think is the opportunity for cannabis in the next five years to emulate some of the learnings from pharma? How do we take the, what we have collectively learned in, in, the, in the big pharma and, and, and why? Why do we care what doctors think? And that's well, one of the question marks. This is the first, you know, it's, it's an open source medicine. Why do we even need doctors? Right. You know, and, 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 you know, a lot of this uh, movement was started by patients asking doctors about medical cannabis. You know, I want to transition off this pharmaceutical into something, you know, maybe a little bit more holistic, something that works in concert um, with my body. And, and, and doctors are at a, a severe disadvantage because they were never taught in med school about the endocannabinoid system. So, you know, when, when Pfizer launched Eliquis, they didn't have to teach doctors about the cardiovascular system. Doctors knew about the cardiovascular, so they knew how the, how the product worked. And doctors not knowing about the endocannabinoid system, you know, everything else after that kind of doesn't make sense to a lot of doctors because they don't know about the endocannabinoid system. I think that's where everything begins. Once we teach doctors about the ECS, then everything else starts to kind of fall in place. And I think what we're going to see um, in the future, in the very near future, and I think it's happening now, but we're going to start to see it a lot more going forward, is clinical trials done by pharmaceutical companies and the presentation of data and science in a form that doctors are comfortable with. 
And that, that does go back to those double blind placebo controlled studies. You know, once those start happening in earnest, I think you're going to see the attitude change and, and, and change rapidly and, and dramatically. So, and that is, that is a, a very good point. I mean, we have, how do we talk in the language of physicians? Because that's one thing that pharma does extraordinarily well. Uh, and it, we see it in many, many different forms, whether it be patient information kits, whether it be physician information kits or continuing education uh, uh, seminars, pharma is extraordinarily good at communicating with physicians. Obviously, they understand the value because in, in traditional pharma, the, the physician has to write a prescription before anything happens. And cannabis, it's, it's a different business model. Uh, but how, that, regardless, what can we learn from pharma in terms of how do we engage with physicians in a level they understand to get them to understand the ECS and to recommend products? Yeah, I, I think you bring up a great point and you, you, you're zeroing right in on it. So the, the number one source of information for doctors um, to learn about uh, breakthrough therapies or anything uh, new in, in the industry are medical journals. Study after study bears that out. Number two is colleagues. So, you know, I think if you can use um, those two sources, or it's a, it's a great place to at least start. Key, key you know, opinion leaders. Key, KOLs, key opinion leaders. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Kind of set the tone for the rest of the industry. If you could kind of start there, you know, and, and present this information, this science, um, and this research in a form that, that doctors are comfortable and familiar with, which is, which is starts out with medical journals and then extends out to conferences and symposium and poster presentations and all the other traditional uh, ways of communicating. And you're right, pharma does a great, great job of communicating with the doctor. Um, and I think the patient will play a very large role in communicating with the physician as well. Help us understand for those that aren't in pharma, what, what does it mean to be peer reviewed? Why is that important to a physician? You know, a doctor needs to know that the information that they're consuming is accurate. And, and that's really what it comes down to. So a, a peer review system just helps to ensure that, that the, um, the content that a physician is consuming is, is in fact uh, accurate and has been checked out by, by folks, you know, in the same industry, in the same specialty. So it's like a fact checker. Basically, yeah. And okay. we've talked <laughs> up a lot lately in the news <laughs> fact check. But um, and, and, and the, the interesting thing about cannabis, because it is in the United States specifically illegal, mm -hmm. and CBD is illegal, and I, I like to talk with Peter Pitts, who's on our board of advisors about CBD, and says, let's start out, he says, let's be clear, it is illegal. <laughs> you cannot make any claims. And so how does, how does a, a, a CBD brand or any brand uh, uh, position themselves with a physician in order to garner that 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 holy grail of a physician recommendation if you can't make any claims. Yeah, you're, you're, you know, you're starting to see a lot of, of the CBD companies do very robust research and data collection, and uh, it, it's a welcome sight. You're starting to even see certain um, CBD companies uh, test for things like bioavailability and start to even have the conversation a little bit about dosing. These are the things that doctors are going to need um, to feel comfortable with cannabinoids as, as uh, you know, a therapeutic option. So uh, I, I think what, you, what we're gonna see going forward is as more of this research comes out, as more of this science comes out and doctors feel more and more comfortable with it, you're gonna see a real switch. Yeah, I, the, the peer reviewed aspect is something that doctors trust. Doctors are used to consuming information that way. And, uh, and it, it, it it checks a box of, of, of validity that makes it a lot easier for them to consume the information. Absolutely. Um, and since in this particular category of medicine, we can't make any claims, um, why is that important in terms of the Sunshine Act? And why is that important in terms of what we can and can't say to patients and physicians? Help, help me navigate that, that regulatory mind right. field, why this is important. So a lot, of, a lot of brands are starting to figure out that while they can't say my brand is good for X condition, what they can do is point to science that kind of bears that out. You know, CBD worked very well for chronic pain. And here's a study of 10 patients that kind of bared that fact out. So the CBD company didn't make that claim. They're pointing to the science to say the science made that claim. And it's, I like think, old, it's like the old dentine commercial, four to five dentists recommend. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. They can't make the claim themselves for any condition at this point. You know, the only one that uh, the only one that can, of course, is, is GW. 
But besides them, I don't, there's no one that, that comes to mind that I know that can actually make a claim for a given very specific condition or disease state. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very dangerous to even contemplate it because the moment you get on the radar of the SDA, mm -hmm. that, that makes your life very much more, that much more complicated. Yes. Uh, and the FDA has started handing out fines. Um, and, uh, and so I think what, one of the things that, that pharma understands uh, 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 that cannabis industry can learn from is that we can talk in a different language with doctors than we do with patients. And because we can have that different language um, and get that doctor's and garner that, that holy grail of that doctor's recommendation, we're able to talk about things that we're legally not allowed to talk about with patients. Precisely. Is, is that a fair statement? It is. It is. And, and then there's, you know, there's different, um, there's different tools we can use, like, like CME accreditation, where we can talk a little bit more liberally about, you know, some of the positive effects uh, of cannabis and CBD. So, yeah. And, that, and that's, that's also a big differentiator of CMEs. And that was the, the first thing that I came into this business. I said, there's no continuing medical education credits. How, that, that is, the, that is the, the hook that gets doctors in. That's why the doctors will take time to hear a presentation because they don't want to hear a sales pitch. They want to, they want to learn something that's valuable that they can bring to their practice, that time is limited. So when you guys came out and you offered the, the very first CMEs in the United States, it was, it was very, very exciting and really a momentous occasion for the, for the cannabis industry vis-a-vis uh, -vis the medical uh, uh, applications. I, I think CME is, is going to continue to play a large role moving forward. I think education in general, uh, both CME and non-CME, uh, both for the doctor and, and the patient slash consumer, I think all of that is going to play a very big role. And, and we're looking at you know, going in some of those new and different areas going forward, you know, more uh, creating more of a dialogue between agent and the patient and between the doctor and the patient and also between colleagues, doctor to doctor. Those conversations are very valuable as well. Right. Tell us about your faculty and, and tell us about, about the contributors to the journal, because I think that really speaks just volumes, no pun intended, to the to the quality of the content. Help us understand why that's important. Yeah. So the the editorial board is is the backbone of everything that that we do at Agem and and what we did was we kind of worked our way backwards which typically is not how you do we we started to look at conditions and disease states that um, cannabis has been shown throughout hundreds and thousands of years of history to to successfully treat so wh whether it was gout or, or 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 migraine headache or or, or sleep disorder. Whatever it was, we, we kind of looked at the disease state first, then we looked at who treated that disease state. And then that's how we kind of chose our circulation. So we have a circulation of about 45,000 active um, physicians. As far as the editorial board is concerned, once we determined who we were gonna circulate to, we started to look for folks within that specialty that had some experience with cannabinoid therapy. I can tell you that that was probably one of the hardest parts of, of starting the journal is, is identifying these doctors because some doctors don't want to be identified. Uh, it, you're seeing that less now than you did say three or four years ago, but some doctors who were successfully using cannabinoid therapy didn't want anyone to know that they, that they were. Okay. So even when you did identify a doctor who even had some research about using, um, you know, cannabis with, um, to treat nausea and vomiting, with, with oncology patients, they didn't want you to know they were using cannabis. So what we did was we tried to find the best people that we could who are using cannabis in a given specialty. So oncologists, neurologists, pain specialists, um, palliative care, sports medicine physicians, um, geriatricians for, for our aging population. All these specialties, we, we took a long and hard look at and, de and determined that, yes, uh, we want to include these specialties and then how many. And that is a mirror image of what our editorial board looks like. Doctors from different specialties, all with experience in either studying and researching cannabinoids or actually using them with patients. Got it. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it, I, I, that's an interesting story about how secret, secret therapies, <laughs> doctors are afraid. I, I, I heard an amazing uh, case study of a, of a physician in California where it's, it's been legal for forever, not forever, but since, uh, you know, in recent memory. And um, they're using a, a DNA test to determine this practice if a patient has a propensity to opioid abuse. And if they do, 
They referred them to cannabis therapy for pain management after this is orthopedic surgery. And they've done this to 2,500 patients. Yeah. And I, I met the, the group that was doing, I said, have you talked to anybody about this? Have you tried to put, no, 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 no. I don't want to want to fly under the radar. It's like 2,500 patients is a staggering number. Uh, and, and you're preventing how many potential patients from abuse of opioids because they're propensity. That's a story you want to yell about. Says, Not yet. He says, when I do, we'll know that cannabis has arrived, he said. <laughs> I, I think you just hit on it. You know, here's, here's a, a practice that's successfully treating people with cannabinoid therapy, and they don't want anyone to know about it. No. I mean, when you think about the insanity of that, um, but, it's, but it's very real, and I, can, I, I absolutely understand it. Well, the industry has to transform, and we're at the precipice right now, I think, in terms of medical, uh, so. from, from copying the practice practices of the pain doctors and opioid pill mills uh, into in trying to get cannabis into the mainstream of doctors so they understand so doc so patients don't feel like they have to go to a cannabis doctor right. to get their recommendations they should be able to go to their internist or they should be able to go to their neurologist and and either get a recommendation or advice um, and, that, and that's really what it comes down to uh, is the, what I like to call the three E's to engage uh, educate and empower and, and cannabis is very, very different because this is the first um, uh, therapy where patients probably know more than doctors in many cases. Yeah. And that's very unusual. And doctors are very uncomfortable about that. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a, a doctor likes to be in control of the conversation it, and, and, and cannabis has really turned that doctor patient relationship on its head where the, where the patient coming in knows a whole lot about cannabis and a whole lot about cannabis in regards to their specific condition. You know, so often we hear from doctors that we learn the most from our patients, yeah. which is good and bad. <laughs> well, that's the way it should be. It's the way it should be. If you're listening to your patients, I, I heard a doctor uh, say by actually opening up the conversation about cannabis with their, his patients, that it actually changed the way he practiced medicine because he went through his charts and he saw that there are certain people that had indications that might qualify for cannabis in the state of New Jersey, where this doctor is. And um, he said, I don't know if you've considered it or if you've thought about it or if you do, but in the state of Jersey, your condition qualifies for cannabis. And he said, his conversation with his patients changed. All of a sudden he was doctoring again because they trusted him for the first time. And, it, and, it, 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 and doctors have to think differently because the business model is going to be different with cannabis. Yeah. That people are going to be paying for advice, either through insurance or direct pay. That's what patients are going to be looking for, whether it's covered or not. They want the advice of their doctor. Oh, so that stigma, that drop, that drop in stigmatism over the last year, I think, is really is really moving forward and helping patients have that conversation without fear with their physicians. No, I, I think you're I think you're spot on, and and um, and I think that's gonna that's just gonna continue going forward. That robust conversation between doctor and patient is is not slowing down. It it's it's uh, it's getting more intricate. And to your point trust is coming back into that relationship. And um, in, in a lot of cases, trust wasn't there. And these, these doctor patient visits get down to two or three minutes where a doctor is throwing a prescription at a patient, no conversation, no, no conversation about diet, no conversation about water intake, nothing, no ho holistic discussion at all. And, and that's, starting, that's starting to change. You know, a doctor said to me, uh, you know, speaking on behalf of his practice, he said, we're, we're, most concerned about two things. Number one, in regards to cannabis, losing our license. Yeah, sure. it, you know, your, livelihood. Doctors, your livelihood. Your livelihood. Your livelihood. Some doctors in the practice weren't even sure if they could have the conversation with, with patients about medical cannabis or cannabis at all. Yeah. You know, so losing their license was their number one concern, but a very close number two was losing their patients. Because what a lot of doctors are finding right now is if you can't have that conversation with the patient, the patient isn't probably going to announce right then and there, okay, you know what, since you can't have this conversation with me, I'm going to go to somebody who can. They'll just quietly nod and, okay, thank you, doctor. And then they're gone. Mm -hmm. And the doctor never sees them again. And, right. you know, we're starting to hear that a, a little bit more in the last eight months to a year than we did prior of patients just saying, oh, I, need to, um, I need to have a doctor that I can have conversations with about pharmaceutical drugs and diet and exercise and yoga, um, Ayurvedic uh, therapies, anything. 
and doctors are are being put in this position where they're being asked to kind of uh, learn a lot of things that they didn't learn in medical school. Right. Well, I think one of the, one, if you look at the specialties that are most threatened by cannabis, by cannabinoid therapies, one is psychiatry. Right. And the reason I'm most threatened is because the business model is dependent on me coming back as a patient every quarter, every, two, every month or every three months or every six months or every year. And that's my only source of revenue as a psychiatrist is you coming back to get your refills. Um, if I don't need your prescriptions, if I can go get it at the dispensary for THC or get it over the counter CBD brand, and I don't need you, that's very threatening. Um, and however, a psychiatrist is starting to realize that they get paid for their time, whether they're writing a prescription or not. <laughs> and that's really, and the business model is just you said, think about the business model differently. I've talked to many psychiatrists who are absolutely anti, anti, anti cannabis just a few years ago and now are open to it because they're realizing that by having those discussions, um, they can actually shift their business to where they want it to be and be able to practice medicine. It doesn't matter if you write a prescription, it matters if your patient gets better. Exactly. And I, I and that's the bottom line, you know, it, is the patient getting better? We are not against, I, I think, Dan, you're the same way. We're, we're not against the pharmaceutical industry. We're very, you know, pro anything that can help, you know, so we're not advocates for cannabis. I don't think either one of us are, are cheerleaders for cannabis. We're we're cheerleaders for, for science and for research. And wherever that path leads us um, is, is what I'll be a cheerleader for. And I, th I think you're the same way. Yeah, I'm always surprised by physicians I talk to uh, that are really clueless when it comes to, not by any fault of their own, uh, about the ECS. Uh, and I, I, and I'll, I'll just say, ECS touches everything in the body. It's, nah, it doesn't touch my specialty. I said, it does. Here, Google it. And it's right on the phone. You can look it up. Right. <laughs> and I'll be sitting with my doctor friends, whether it be, you know, OBGYN fertility specialists or whether it be neurologists, easy. They, they've understood the ECS for a while, mm -hmm. uh, the top ones anyway. But, you know, they had no idea that the ECS plays a role in the fertility system that, 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 can, that, can, that can have an impact. Um, he had no idea. And this is a specialty. You know, it's one of the best in the, in, the, in, the, in the city, maybe in the country in this field, and had no idea about the ECS until... I put Google in front of him, the phone and said, look. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's really not their fault either. You know, people get mad no. at doctors for, for not being taught about the, it's not the doctor's fault. They went to med school. They learned everything there was to learn in med school at that time. The ECS wasn't being taught. I think it's still only being taught by 15% of universities. If, if it's percent So, you know, the, the doctor is an easy scapegoat always, but, but I'm going to defend the doctor a little bit you know, they don't know what they don't know and they don't know what they weren't taught. So I think it's it's kind of our responsibility or a role that we can play is kind of helping doctors understand the ECS and the role that it plays in overall health. And that's why your 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 journal is so important to to our our, our industry. Uh, because if we ever do want to win over doctors' hearts and minds and patients. Um, we're going to have to talk in a language they understand. That's why the, the journal is so important because these are peers. These are all people that went to same medical schools, same training programs, same specialties that they went to. And they said, you know, it's, it's, it's a bandwagon effect and, uh, and it legitimizes the industry overnight. Um, uh, to, to say, you know, this is, this is not fake stuff. And I hate when they say there's not enough research. All you got to do is go to one conference in Israel for two days and your mind will explode with the amount of research that's coming out. <laughs> well, just do a simple PubMed search and you'll be there for, for months reading all the research that's there. I mean, yeah. to, I, I, I agree. I hate when I hear there's no, re to me, that's like the ultimate cop out. There's, there's so much research. Yeah. Well, there's no research because the old research to them, uh, brand specific or brand tied to. And that's, that's what's different about cannabis. We don't have an industry that's doing that. That's why the journal is so important. Um, you know, and one of the things that you know, people in the cannabis industry, I think don't understand, don't grasp is the economic power of, of physicians uh, and the, the multiplier effect a physician can have on a, on, a, on a particular brand. You know, a typical intern will carry 1,500 to as many as 4,000, 4,500 patients. Um, that's a lot of patients coming through a practice that, um, that, you know, a good number, a good, you know, double digit percentage of those patients have qualified for some type of cannabinoid therapy. That's why it's the Holy Grail. Economically, it's just the it's numbers. They, they, can, they can affect a lot of patients. Absolutely. You know, 
a doctor said to me recently, just give me the name of a brand. That's yeah. safe. That's safe. He goes, like, all I want to do is, is be able to, when, it, when it, a patient asks me, and it, it happens three, four, five times a day, a patient asks me, for, what brand of CBD should I take? He's like, can you just give me a brand? You know, so I mean, I, I said I can do that, but don't you want to learn a little bit more than just a brand name? He's like, no, I'm good with a brand name right now. That's it, it, it's so funny because I get texts all the time. I have a lot of physician friends. They'll text me all the time. Say, can you recommend a brand for whatever? Whatever. It's like I have the exact same conversation. Let's talk about the ECS. Like we, we need to teach you about the ECS so you can understand yourself and make an educated recommendation. Right. <laughs> That's just what Dan Berman and Kenny Watkins say. Is it? Is yeah. A good brand. <laughs> They're so afraid of of you know their patient taking or ingesting you know. We, we like to, we call it gas station CBD yeah. because, you know, <laughs> because you could right next to your cigarettes, you can buy your, your, your CBD in, in, in the mobile station by my house. And that's scary. You know, no one knows what's in there. Is there any even CBD in there? Are there high levels of THC? Are there lead? You know, there's so many different things that can, and especially with, you know, with the elderly patient, there's different things that can interact with, you know, the, the medications that they're already on. You gotta be really, really careful. So, you know, this one doc, doctor in particular was almost didn't care about whether it worked or not, just that it didn't do any harm. It didn't hard, do any harm. Well, that's their Hippocratic Oath. And, right. and, uh, and uh, that's, that's their basis. Right. That's why they've been so hesitant until now to make a recommendation, because of safety. Not because of efficacy, safety. That's it. You know, why does a physician recommend it's going to be safety, e efficacy, and, and, and science? That's why, they'll make a, that's why they'll make a recommendation. You're right. So, you know, any, any brand that can attest themselves to that um, is, is going to have a leg up in the marketplace, which is Absolutely. exactly your business model, which is why having you in this market is so important. <laughs> you know, if, if you could become the Xerox of, of CBD, you've won. That's it. You know, that, it kind of game over. But I, I don't think there's going to be one major player like Xerox. I think there's a lot of really high quality brands starting to emerge right now. And what I love about a lot of these brands is, is the amount of research that they're doing, because that appeals directly to the physician. Yeah. So when a physician looks at a company and sees that they're doing, you know, um, bioavailability testing, immediately there's a comfort level with that brand and that product. And, and I, like, I like the direction that's going in. Yeah, I agree 100. percent Kenny, thank you so much for all you're doing for the industry, and uh, go ahead and give us a plug for Agemp where people can find you, and uh, and we'll wrap this up. Sure, we're gonna be we're gonna be publishing in a, in the next couple of weeks. Our um, you know our our Jan Feb issue is gonna be uh, coming out in uh, probably about 10 days now. Okay. Um, we'll we'll be mailing 45 print issues, 45,000 print issues out. And some of the content will be up on our new website, which will be released in, a, in two or three weeks as well. So we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of new and interesting things going on with AGM. You know, in addition to the doctor, we are starting to look a little bit more um, at the patient now, just because we, we get a lot of requests to do so. And, and you know, people are asking us to, uh, hey, help us out with the patient. We'll be doing some work um, in the UK, um, helping to, to, to educate their doctors uh, and help help the, um, the children who have epilepsy um, access their CBD because in a post-Brexit world, it's been difficult for these children. So they've asked us to kind of come over and, you know, and discuss that a little bit. So, you know, we've got things going on internationally and, and domestically that are very exciting that we can't wait to kind of uh, un unveil. Well, I really look forward to seeing the next issue. Uh, I look forward to uh, 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 working with you on many projects and, and helping educate physicians uh, and medical practitioners on the ECS. And thank you for all the work you do for the industry and for the, the loud voice that you've brought. Uh, when, when, uh, when we finally met and, and you made your big launch, I, I said, this is the industry has arrived and then COVID happened and everyone <laughs> took a breath and held our breath and we're, we're getting back on the road now. Yeah. So I'm super excited to, 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 to be working with you and, and bringing this to the market. I feel the same way, Dan. It's, uh, you know, we, we, COVID really kind of ruined everything for, for 2020, but we're, we're excited. And I, and I feel like, you know, the conversation has come back even more strongly than it was a year ago, you know, with, with so many different stakeholders wanting to learn about, about cannabis and, and other things that affect the endocannabinoid system. So it's, it's really an exciting time. And, and, well, and physicians are looking, everybody is looking and reevaluating their, their business and their life at
after COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. Our business has changed dramatically. Your business has changed dramatically. And so I think in that reevaluation process, there's an opportunity to get doctors and physicians and medical uh, uh, professionals' attention. Yeah. Because they're open to it now. When in the past, now I got my business model, it works, I'm making money. Now they realize they got to look for ideas to make a living in the next three, four years that might not be the way they made it in the previous three, four years. I, I think you're right. I think everyone is kind of revisiting, you know, the old ways and say, is, is there a better way to do it? And in many cases, I think there is, and they're finding it. Great. Kenny, it was great chatting with you. Uh, look forward to doing this again really soon. Have a great yeah. day. This has been great, Dan. Thank you for having me. Thank you.